Welcome, I'm Father Mitch Paquin. Welcome to Scripture and Tradition, where we look at the Holy Word of God and try to understand it, but we do so through the lens of the apostolic tradition. That is, the tradition that goes back to the apostles and Jesus. And in addition to that, we are also looking at Scripture in order to pray through it and come to know our Savior Jesus better. Come to be closer to Him and know Him and be known by Him. Now, of course, we'd love to have you be part of our show by adding your questions and comments. You can do that by uh, sending us your questions via email. You can write to Scripture and Tradition at EWTN.com. Or you can follow us and participate with the show on YouTube. So, love to have you. Now, we are going to continue what we started two weeks ago, which is looking at the 12 apostles. And we are especially going to start getting into the ways where they're not only limited and sometimes weak, but they were also spiritually blind to Jesus' message. Even though they were close to Christ and they heard his preaching and they also saw his miracles and exorcisms, still they were um, blind. (laughs) That's the fact of life. Now, we are going through my book, which is called Wheat and Tares, Restoring the Moral Vision of a Scandalized Church. You can get this book at EWTN's Religious Catalog. Just go online to EWTNRC.com. It is item number 81098. 81098. Okay? Now, we are in the chapter called Prelude to the Failure of the Apostles. And for the last two weeks, I've been taking a look at the list of apostles. We went through the list in Matthew a couple weeks ago. Last week we looked at the list in Mark, which is very rich. There's a lot there. And we looked at a lot of the apostles and saw more about them. Now we are going to look at the list in the Gospel of St. Luke. And that's in Luke Chapter 6, verses 12 to 16. Okay. So let's start off. Now, first of all, in verse 12, chap- Luke chapter 6, verse 12, it says, In these days Jesus went out into the hills to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. Very important introduction to this. Because St. Luke, more than the other Gospels, emphasizes how much our Lord went out and prayed. He was in prayer with, uh, to the Father a lot. And it wasn't just asking the Father for things, but it was also a prayer of communion with the Father. Remember how he talked about how he loves his Father, his Father loves him. And he spent time with the Father, in union with his Father. The Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are one God, but it's a oneness of love. Remember how 1 John chapter 4 says, God is love. And this is a statement possible only because the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are absolutely in infinite self-gift to each other from all eternity. So here we see our Lord going out on the mountain to pray. And as we saw 
in the Gospel of Mark. Being up on the mountain is, again, another way to connect with Moses, who went up to the mountain to be in communion with God. Not as deep as our Lord's communion, but he was in communion with God. And this was where he, Moses, came to understand the Lord's call to the people of Israel, the 12 tribes. Here on this mountain, our Lord chooses the 12 apostles. And that's what we see in verse 13. In Luke 6, 13, when it was day, he called his disciples and chose from them 12, whom he named apostles. Now, this is something worth noting because the disciple, the word disciple, uh, discipulos, means one who follows. So disciples were following Jesus. But from among his disciples, and he had many, but from among those disciples, he chose his 12, whom he named apostles. Apostolos, or apostle, means one who is sent. In fact, the Pharisee rabbis would name some of their disciples shaluchim, the ones who were sent because they would also send disciples to represent them. Jesus chooses these shaluchim, these apostles, as the one that he will send. Now, he lists the name, um, but there, we'll give a couple notes about this, um, but not much, because it's very similar to Mark. Uh, in Luke 6:14, it begins with Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew his brother, and James and John. That's the first group of four. Then we see, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas. The second group of four, just as in the other two Gospels. And then we see the third group of four and James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who's called the Zealot, instead of the Cananean, it's called the Zealot, but Cananean means zealot. zealot. Zelotes is the word, the Greek word that St. Luke uses. And Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. So here uh, we see that St. Luke puts the two Judases side by side. We still honor St. Jude the Apostle, uh, of course, one of the uh, most wonderful and, and famous institutions named after St. Jude is St. Jude's Hospital. It's a hospital for children, especially with cancer. And uh, St. Jude was chosen by Danny Thomas, the founder of that hospital. Uh, because St. Jude is the patron saint of hopeless cases. And he also was one of the missionaries to Lebanon, where Danny Thomas's family came from. So Danny Thomas's uh, family would be Christians who were Maronites. They used Aramaic still in the liturgy. And uh, they their ancestors 2,000 years ago were evangelized by the Apostle Jude. So Danny Thomas used Jude the Apostle for those two reasons. His own background as a descendant of those evangelized by the Apostle Jude and Jude's uh, strong, strong um, patronage for those whose cases are hopeless, but they're not really. Whereas Judas Iscariot as we mentioned last week, we don't know exactly what the name Iscariot means. Is it a man from Kiriot? You know, there was a town called Kariot. Uh, and so is he Ish Kariot, a man of that town of Kariot? Um, does it come from Sicarius, the word for a knife, because he was an assassin? Um, we just don't know. Is it a last name? Uh, does it mean fraud or deceit? Those were some of the possible meanings of it. Uh, we don't know for sure what it meant. Um, but in contrast to St. Jude, the son of James, 
this Jude is Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Now, just as another little side point, why would they be named Judas? Well, Judas is just the Greek form of Judah. Judah is the name of the tribe, and it was a name commonly used among people from that tribe, still is. You know, the number of, uh, I've had a wonderful Jewish student in my Hebrew class whose name was Judah. Um, uh, it would be in Hebrew, Yehuda, but this would be his name. So it's, that's not an unusual name, just like James. A lot of people say, how come everybody's named James? It doesn't sound Jewish. Well, actually, it is, James is the English translation of Yaakov, Jacob. Now, you shouldn't be too surprised to come up on disciples, Jewish disciples named Jacob. You know, that's their ancestor, the father of all 12 tribes. So there's, you know, James the, the Greater, who's the brother of John, James the Less, who is a son of Alphaeus, as was Matthew. And then there's James the brother of the Lord, who is the child of his uncle, our Lord's uncle, uh, Clopas and his wife Mary, uh, not the Virgin Mary. Uh, so, you know, this is, th these are common names that we see among Jewish people. We shouldn't be surprised. They're very authentic Jewish names. Bartholomew is, means the son of Tomai. Uh, Thomas, Toma is twin in Aramaic. So these are common names and we see them. Now, there's one other list of names one of the list of names, and that is found in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 13. This is described soon after the apostles returned from the Mount of Olives, where they had seen Jesus ascend into heaven. So he ascended into heaven, and we see there that there are 11 apostles left. In Acts 1.13, they are listed as Peter and John and James and Andrew, first group of four, then Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, the second group of four, same ones as in the other uh, second group of four, and then James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. So, um, so you've got that, but who's missing? Judas Iscariot. And St. Luke goes on to describe how, Saint, uh, how uh, Judas Iscariot died, uh, you know, after that was burst asunder. And, you know, this is something that we see that becomes very important for them because at that point, the apostles cite uh, one of the Psalms. Uh, in which it says, um, you know, that as they, re they returned, uh, first of all, with prayer. Um, you know, this is a very important room. They went to the upper room where they were staying and praying, and they devoted themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And then St. Peter, you know, um, you know, speaks and again shows his leadership. And he says that, uh, he, he explains that Judas betrayed them, betrayed Jesus, uh, and fulfilled a prophecy from the Psalms, in which, you know, his, uh, in the Psalms it says, let his habitation become desolate, let there be no one to live in it, and let and his office let another take. This is a quote from Psalm uh, 109, verse 8. Um, that's where it says, let another take his office. And then Psalm 69, verse 25, may this camp be desolate and no one dwell in it. So they cite these two Psalms and they decide that they need to choose a 12th apostle, and they choose St. Matthew. Now, this is important because our Lord Jesus had ascended into heaven. 
He did not tell them, now go back and choose a twelfth. As they were together in prayer amongst themselves and with Our Lady and the Holy Women and Brothers Jesus, and uh, also eventually 120 people were in the upper room. It must have been a large room, but they had 120 people. And they decide to choose a replacement for Judas. Why is that? They understand that our Lord chose 12 disciples and that there was supposed to be a base of 12 to parallel the 12 tribes of Israel. As I said a couple weeks ago, they are not going to be the progenitors of a tribe. They're not going to start tribes physically, but they are going to be a new Israel who instead of the physical seed of a man, they are going to proclaim the word of God as an imperishable seed and that it will be a seed that grows up for eternal life. And so they will be the 12 starters of the church. And before Pentecost, they need that 12th. That's what they're doing. And they choose Matthias. Now, our Lord did not give them a principle for choosing a 12th. This was something that came to them in prayer, and they decided to cast lots, something that was done in the Old Testament as well. When they had no other basis, they didn't know we have a number of people, especially two good candidates, uh, and they both were with the Lord from the beginning all the way through the ascension. They're witnesses of what he did. They, that's what they used as a criterion. They wanted a witness to everything the Lord said and did. But then you have two candidates. Which one do you choose? They didn't have a principle. So then they cast lots and they chose Matthias. And he becomes the 12th who replaces Judas. Something else about that, though. While they choose a twelfth, that only applies to the church as it goes toward Pentecost, because at this point the apostles were in prayer, as again St. Luke says in uh, Acts 1. They were in the upper room in prayer, and they prayed the first novena. Nine days in a row they prayed. That's where our idea of a novena comes from. And then on the tenth day of praying for the Father's gift of the Holy Spirit, they receive the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. This is the gift that they receive on the tenth day. So they pray for nine days doing that first novena, and they pray for the Holy Spirit. Well, before they receive the Holy Spirit together, they want the full complement of 12. But after Pentecost, they don't choose another apostle to replace each one as they die off. Now, in Acts of the Apostles, the only apostle who dies during the time of Acts of the Apostles, which is from the ascension of Jesus around 30 or so, until 62 when Paul is in prison. So Acts of the Apostles covers 32 years or so. And they don't say, well, we have to have a 12th guy to replace St. James after he was beheaded. They don't do that. And throughout the history of the church, we don't limit to 12 apostles. That's not what we do. Because the apostles didn't do that. Instead, they will choose more and more bishops, and they will establish bishops all over the place. Where do they get the idea of the bishops? The word bishop, episkopos in Greek, translates a Hebrew word that's found among the Dead Sea Scrolls at Qumran, that the 12 leaders of the community at Qumran were called mevakarim, a mevaker 
is an overseer. The Greek word for that is episkopos, and from episkopos comes our English word bishop. It comes to us through German, episkopos to bischof, bischof to bishop. And they had now thousands of bishops all over the place. So they didn't limit to 12 after Pentecost, but beforehand they wanted to be 12. That's what you see in Acts chapter 1. All right, well, let's stop there. We've gone through all the four lists of the apostles and some of the meaning of it. Now we'll start to take a look at how the apostles also showed spiritual blindness to Jesus. Please stay with us. Welcome back, and we are now going to take a look. We've looked at the list of names and the diversity of God with some of their political tensions and ideological tensions that they held among them and their personality issues like being sons of thunder and angry kind of people. And we just got an introduction to that a little bit. Now we're going to take a look how through the public ministry, there were lots of times that the apostles showed themselves to be blind to understanding Jesus, even though they kept walking with him. He chose sinners. That's all that he had to choose from. And this, is that no matter how many miracles and exorcisms, how much teaching he gave, they had a problem with the blindness. And this is something that we can look at for a self-examination. We're not there to criticize the apostles as such. Rather, we can see ourselves in them. We have various problems, and we need to examine our own consciences. Um, and that includes us clergy, those who are bishops, and priests, deacons, seminarians, and of course brothers and nuns, all of us, need to examine ourselves, but especially priests, uh, bishops, priests, and deacons, and seminarians who are succeeding Christ in leading the church. And spiritual blindness to Jesus really has a negative effect on our own morality. The moral life of the clergy is going to be worse if we are blind. So every one of us has to examine himself or herself uh, and look for the logs of sin that are in our eyes because it blocks the light of Jesus Christ from coming through. Think back on Matthew chapter 7, begin with verses 1 through 5, where our Lord said, Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce you will be judged, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take this speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. It's absolutely essential that each one of us admits our own spiritual blindness and moral weakness. Even when we have good intentions, we have to do this um, because 
if we don't admit it, we don't admit our wrongs, then the healing light of Jesus Christ cannot enter us, and we need him. We have to pray to examine our conscience, because the, examining our consciences is not just automatically easy. Keep that in mind. To examine your conscience means that you need the grace of the Holy Spirit, as we'll see a couple, a few months from now when we look at some other passages in the Gospel of John 16. We'll see that the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts us of sin. We need the grace, the gift of the Holy Spirit to convict us of sin. And this is a very important so that we seek holiness and virtue rather than self-centeredness and vice. This is going to be the case, okay? Now, let's start to take a look. That's the basic principle. Let's take a look at something we already looked at when we covered the uh, book that on uh, praying the Gospels, the second one we did, Jesus' Miracles in Galilee. We concluded that book with a passage from Mark chapter 8, verses 14 to 21. I just want to start off there. Remember, this is right after Jesus multiplied loaves and fish. They got into the boat. They're crossing the sea. And our Lord gives them a, a warning. They, they only had one loaf of bread. They'd forgotten to bring bread. They had only one loaf with them in the boat. Uh, so that's in Mark 8, verse 14. And, you know, they would have to be thinking about how they'd have to divide up that loaf into 13 pieces. Uh, would be a little bit. They would have that in their mind. And because they're focused on the lack of bread that they had forgotten to bring, they are blind to what Christ is saying to them. So he says in chapter 8, verse 15, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. This is uh, something now. This was um, uh, an admonition that came after he had trouble with the Pharisees in Mark 8, 11 to 13, when they began to argue with him, seek a sign from him and test him. And he even said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign shall be given this generation. And he left them, and that's when he got into the boat. So there's that Pharise the, 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 the leaven of the Pharisee comes from um, the, uh, their lack of faith. And then the, there's other tensions as well when, he, they were, he was eating with the Pharisees, the tax collectors, he claimed to be over the Sabbath, all these. And these tensions increased. And that's why he warned the apostles against the influence of the Pharisees. Leaven causes a loaf to rise. So it's this kind of influence. And the Herodians were plotting to kill Jesus. We saw that uh, in a couple places, like uh, chapter 3, verse 6, when he healed on the Sabbath. They'll try to trick him about paying taxes to Caesar and show him the coin and all this. So the Herodians have their own political agenda by which they reject Jesus, and the Pharisees had a religious agenda. And they all had a leaven, that is, an influence. But when Jesus says this, the apostles respond in Mark chapter 8, verse 16, and they see his admonition to, against the leaven or influence of the Pharisees and Herodians, and said, oh, it's because he, he got us. We forgot to bring bread. We forgot, oh man, now he's mad at us. Our Lord rebukes them, not because they didn't bring bread, but because they didn't understand. He was aware of it, and Jesus said to them, why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive 
or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? You know, he's upbraiding them because they misunderstand him. Of course, these are rhetorical questions, um, but the issue is that they don't understand all the things that he's been saying and doing. And they, they, their hearts have been hardened at other times, like uh, after the first multiplication of loaves and fish, and when he walks on the water, their hearts were hardened, he says in Mark 6, verse 52. Um, this was after the storm. and They were astounded in hard hearts. They had been given the, mis the mystery or the secret of the kingdom of God. They couldn't understand him. And they have, they're privileged to have Jesus teaching them. They're observing what he says to the crowds. And he explains things in secret to them back in the house. And they don't get it. That's why... In one sense, this statement, do you not yet understand in Mark 8, 21, this is a rebuke for the whole first half of the gospel. This is about halfway through the gospel of Mark. And they, you know, they, he, they don't understand. And it's very interesting. Even though Jesus rebukes them, these men are honest enough to understand Jesus is speaking the truth. They don't understand. The only one who really doesn't like being upbraided is Judas Iscariot. He never seemed to understand. He never got it. And the apostles who remained with Jesus eventually would understand, but they had to stay faithful. And Judas, the Pharisees, the Herodians, and the Sadducees all failed to understand. And it was true that, you know, throughout the whole public ministry that they didn't understand. So we modern disciples have to examine our own consciences. And we have to ask ourselves, am I really understanding the mysteries of the gospel? I really understand what Jesus said. And it's important to realize there are Pharisees and Herodians outside the, the church. These are symbols of the various forces in our society, forces that don't like the religion of Christ, forces that don't like his moral teaching or and how it affects politics. politics. We have atheists you know, who hate God, they hate Christ, they hate religion, they hate the church. And we have cynical politicians and cynical business people who want to manipulate religion and the church for their own purposes. Some will call themselves Catholics in public, even as they flat out oppose the church's teachings. They don't obey the church's teachings. They go against them. They fight against what the church teaches. Today, on issues of sexuality, in times past, on issues like slavery and race. But they go against it. They still want to be called good Catholics. And this is something that we have to understand, that will we accept God's rebukes and humbly say, okay, I still need to learn? Or do we act like the Pharisees, the Herodians, and Judas? I don't want to learn. You can't teach me anything. I don't get it because there's nothing there. I don't like it. It's wrong, and I'm right. This is the attitude of many people. And it's not just people outside the church. There are priests and bishops there have been cardinals throughout the history of the church who reject the teaching of Christ. They're selfish. They are careerists. They care more about what they're going to get from following Jesus. Some of them want to become rich. They want to live a good life. They live a sinful life. 
and they think it's okay. This is something that we've seen throughout the history of the church. It continues through all times, including our own. And so we have to all pay attention to Jesus' question. Do you not understand? Do you not understand? That And if we don't, admit it. And ask, Lord, I don't, but help me understand. And never, ever become so arrogant and say, well, I don't understand and I don't want to bother. This, if, if I can't get it, nobody can. So this isn't worth my time. Then you're Judas. And you don't want to be Judas. That's not a good end. So this is something for us to consider. We'll stop there and we'll take a look at the next area where the apostles don't, they're still blind even after this to Jesus' teaching, especially about his death and resurrection. So we'll continue that next week. We'll stop here and we'll take, start to take a look at some of your questions. I'm going to begin with an email from Fran. Um, here it says, Dear Father Mitch, recently the first reading in the Office of Readings has been from the book of Revelation. On a couple of days, the readings talked about the seven angels and what they are going to do. My question is, are we going to be witnesses to these happenings? Will these take place at the end times or have these happenings occurred? And what is written is symbolic. It's from Fran in Sunnyside, New York. Um, Fran, these would be things that do take place toward the end of time. They, they haven't happened yet. There have been similar things, but not on the order and scale that the book of Revelation mentions. These are things for the end. And C.S. Lewis had a great comment that as we get to the time when these events happen, we'll be able to recognize them. I don't know that they're symbolic. I don't think these are meant to be symbolic. These are disasters that are meant to come upon the earth to punish the people of earth for their sin and that maybe some of them would repent. Just like the plagues that afflicted the Egyptians were meant to get them to change their mind and they didn't. Here, the plagues that are mentioned in the book of Revelation will be there to punish sinners so that hopefully they wake up, remove their blindness, and ask Jesus to forgive their sins and give them faith. So that would be the purpose of that. Um, what we need to pay attention to, though, is that we don't get too jumpy and say, well, oh yeah, this has happened. There, a lot of people do that, too. They get a little jumpy and claim that this one is fulfilled now. No, that one is now. Be careful uh, and not try to say more than you can. All right, we'll take a break. Uh, please stay with us and we'll get back to more of your questions and comments. Please stay with us. Right, welcome back. And first I want to invite you to join me tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for EWTN Live. And we'll have what's going to be certainly a lively discussion with our old friends, Fathers Kenneth Brigenti and John Tregilio Jr. Uh, this will be about their special collection of short less than a minute videos called Catholic Blitz that provide concise, expert answers to common questions of faith. They'll be always fun. They're, they're good guys and uh, enjoy them both. And by the way, for some of you 
uh, viewers of EWTN who've been watching us for a long time and remember some of <laughs> Mother Angelica's wise guy comments. She used to talk about how some people have a look on their face like they were baptized in pickle juice. I don't know if you ever heard her say that. Uh, maybe on some of the uh, Mother Angelica classics too, you hear it. Well, I've gone one up beyond her. I don't know that I was baptized in pickle juice, but I sure love pickle soup. Uh, <laughs> I just thought I'd give myself a little change from my usual tea um, and do a little less caffeine today and eat some Zupo Gurkova. Pickle soup. How many of you guys make that? Hmm? <laughs> All right, let's get back down here to business. Uh, first of all, I would like to answer an email from Eileen, who lives in Los Angeles, California. She writes, Hi, Father Rich. I've been attending a church recently. The sub celebrant's chair has been placed in front of the tabernacle. I've always understood that this should never be done as it is considered disrespectful and could also be seen as arrogant and a sign of disbelief in the true presence. Please shed some light on my concern and discomfort in seeing the priest seated in front of the tabernacle. Eileen in Los Angeles. Well, Eileen, um, I don't find this comforting either. I kind of share your uh, response. Uh, the issue at Mass is to point to Jesus. Now, there are points at which the priest takes our Lord's place and that, you know, we say the words of Jesus at Mass, especially at the consecration. You know, when the priest says, this is my body, this is the chalice of my blood. And so we, we act in the person of Christ. But Christ is particularly present in the Blessed Sacrament. And in this church, as you're describing it, the, there's a tabernacle where the Blessed Sacrament is reserved. Sounds like it's at the center. That's where it should be. The tabernacle should be in the center so that we focus on Jesus. And we, I don't think, you know, we priests ought to have our chair in front of our Lord. Uh, it, I think it I do agree that this would distract. I don't know why they did this. There might be some other issue, um, but it would be something worth bringing up uh, among some of the other parishioners and see their reaction and, you know, maybe go to Father. That would be a good thing. Go to Father and say, Father, this isn't, you know, uh, we, we, we love you. Uh, great that you're here for us. But, you know, you're in the way. It's like the guy who stands up in a movie and walks in front of the movie camera and we see his shadow on the screen. Sit down, sit down, down in front. That's, that may be an appropriate reaction so that we, again, always keep focused on Jesus, our Lord, okay? Now, there's an interesting one from Catherine in Indiana. Father Paco, my 11-year-old daughter has a friend who is a boy her same age, who's 11. The boy says he loves the Lord and wants to be baptized. However, the boy only goes to church when he's occasionally with his grandparents. His parents don't really attend church, and although his mother is willing to support her son in the faith as best she can, his father is opposed to the faith and the idea of going to church due to past hurts and trauma. Being 11 years old, the boy the boy is old enough to commit to the faith, but not old enough to get to the church on his own. With a weak support network at home, how should the boy's baptismal desires be handled? Catherine in Indiana. Well, a couple things. Um, bless him. You know, and you know, we 
I've talked many times about those people who say, well, I don't want to baptize my child. Let the child make up his or her own mind when they're older. Um, that may have been a line that this person had used. I don't know. The father, that is. But now the boy has made up his mind. And he's, of course, still only 11 and is limited in what he can do. But he can make that act of faith. And he should. And this would be something that even if his father is opposed, he would not be the first child to uh, have a father opposed to the faith. And, you know, in these days when people are taking drugs and, you know, having children out of wedlock and all this, if rebellion against your father means going to church, uh, <laughs> I think I'd take it. Uh, that would be a, a welcome form of rebellion. And here's what you can do. Look for ways, since he's a friend of your daughter, there may be a way where you can make an arrangement. If the father can't talk about it, I understand. Uh, but maybe talk to the mom and say, look, uh, we'll be happy to pick your son up and we'll take him to church. Even if it means you going out of your way, you will be doing such a wonderful good deed. This is a great work. And you never know how our Lord may want to use that young boy to help his father deal with faith. May not be comfortable for dad, but it may be a way for the boy just to be a good witness and maybe help the dad overcome those past hurts and be healed. Past hurts don't have to stay hurt. They can have healing from Christ. So pray for the dad too. But I'll, I'll do that as well. Um, and pray for the dad that he experienced healing from whatever past hurts he has and encourage the boy to enter the church and be baptized. And then whenever you can, help him. If, if he cannot get to church because no one will take him, that's not his fault. He's not committing a sin in it by any means. And, you know, tell him then to listen to Mass uh, on radio or online or, you know, the EWTN app, things like that, and join us that way uh, until he can get to Mass every week. But help him with that. That would be a good thing. Really. Uh, talk about spiritual works of mercy. That would be one to help him out. All right, Catherine. Then we have another from Matthew in Tacoma, Washington beautiful state up there. Father Mitch, would you mind explaining the Last Supper? I understand that it was the Passover meal that most Jews celebrated, but Jesus ate it on Thursday. And the Bible states that he had to be taken down from the cross on Friday because it was the day of preparation for the Passover. I think I understand in that there are two calendars in use, one by the Essenes and one by the Jews, as they celebrated the Passover on separate days. Is that correct? Matthew and Tacoma, you are right as rain. And the, um, the Essenes had a solar calendar and they celebrated Passover on a Wednesday. Every year it was on a Wednesday, no matter what. And whereas the Pharisees and the Sadducees used a lunar calendar, so it varied more often. So the they would have <clears throat> the, the Essenes would have celebrated on a Wednesday uh, the Passover, and the Pharisees would have started on Friday, uh, Friday evening. So actually, they would have begun on Tuesday evening at sundown, and uh, the Pharisees on Friday at sundown. It's interesting to note that the uh, neighborhood where the Last Supper was held was in the Essene 
quarter of Jerusalem. The Essenes had their own neighborhood. They even had their own gate and they had latrines outside the gate. Um, and they were discovered by a uh, priest archaeologist, Father Bargel Pixner, a uh, uh, Benedictine priest, wonderful German priest. Um, and uh, he discovered that. So the fact that they were in the upper room, uh, you know, in the Essene neighborhood makes it even more feasible that this was, you know, a celebration from the Essene calendar. And then the Pharisees and Sadducees were celebrating from the lunar calendar that they used. Okay. Then we have another email. This one is from Luis in Miami. Father Paco, as I understand it, angels in heaven have free will like humans here in this world. Will we humans retain our free will when we go to heaven? If so, will it be possible for us to sin in heaven as did the angels who fell and became demons? Um, Luis, we will have our free will, but there is going to be a difference that and when we go to heaven, for, you know, we won't have our bodies, okay? And, you know, I don't, I don't know if you know, you may never have had to worry about trying to lose some weight, but you can make a decision in your mind, I've got to lose weight. But then all of a sudden your body starts to feel hunger and you want to give in to the chocolate cake. Well, there's nothing healthy around, so I might as well just eat chocolate cake or ice cream. Um, you know, we give in to those because we've got these different urges. In heaven, we won't have that you know, split sense of desires. Our desires will be purified and will only desire to love God. That all of our desire will be focused on God directly. And that will be the difference. The angels have free will, but once they made their decision, they feel no inclination towards something else. Same for us in heaven. We have a free will to continue to love God freely, but no longer will there be the inclinations to commit sin. That attraction to bad choices won't be there. So our free will is oriented solely to the very positive decision to love God with our whole heart, our whole mind and our whole soul. That will be the main difference. And it, as far as I'm concerned, that will be a welcome difference. It's, again, looking at it as not just a, a freedom to be able to choose something bad, but at that point, freed of um, any original sin and its effects, we choose only what's good. That's the purpose of our free will to choose good and not just say, well, I could choose bad. Yeah, you could, but don't, don't choose the good. All right, and I have to choose something else, which is ending this show because we're out of time. So may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and lead you in all of your ways by his peace. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Again, remember that as Mother was inspired to set this up, the network is brought to you by you. So please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll be able to pay our bills too. God bless you, and thank you. Mm -hmm.